I'd like to move on uh, now to two last topics. One is um, treatment-free remissions, mm. okay? Can we, do you think it's safe to stop the, any of these drugs? What's the data and what guidance would you give clinicians? It is safe to do treatment-free remission. There's been several studies now that have reported the safety of that, but it has to be done right. I think that it is important. Um, we are considering these on patients who have a very good response to the drug. So if you don't do it right, you can convert something that's very good into something that could potentially be very bad. So, so that's why it's important to recognize who is the right patient and how do you do it. So the criteria that was established with the initial studies that, that started all of these, which is the STEAM trial from, from uh, France and the TWISTER trial from Australia, was that patients should have a deep molecular response sustained for at least two years with five measurements during those two years. Essentially, you've been measuring every six months and they've had that sustained deep molecular response. These initial studies define deep molecular response as undetectable with a five log um, sensitivity of the PCR, something that's difficult to assess. And, and, and so, so we've defaulted into an MR 4.5, which is something that's more common to get in the in the, in the laboratory reports that we all get from whether it's in our own institution or in one of the commercial labs, I think that's something that, that's more, more established. So minimum of two years of a sustained um, deep molecular response defined as MR 4.5. In that patient population, grossly about 40% of patients have remained undetectable uh, or, or have remained with MR 4.5. There's about a 20% of patients who may become detectable, but they remain in major molecular response. And then there's 40% who lose their major molecular response. Nowadays, we consider that as long as they maintain their major molecular response, you can continue without therapy. The exception would be if they lost their MR4 twice in a row consecutively, because that's a patient that's probably heading there. But there are the occasional patient who's, I don't know, undetectable, and then you get a 0 0.01. Sometimes they go back down. Sometimes you get another 0 0.01. But th those very low levels, those seem to be okay so far. Now, you can need to continue monitoring, but you don't necessarily need to resume therapy. Once you lose major molecular response, you have to resume right away. And then important, the monitoring. The monitoring has to be very frequent. The first six months is when there's the highest risk of relapse. Uh, probably 80, 85% of patients who are going to relapse will relapse within the six months. So the recommendations vary a little bit in the, recommend in, in the different guidelines. Uh, I do it every, every month for the first six months. Again, it's only PCR. It's just peripheral blood. So uh, it's relatively simple for the patient. Then I go to uh, every two months in, in the next six months. So that takes me to a year. Then every three months for a year. And then every six months. And the six months continues indefinitely. The, the concept here is if, if it's going to come back, you want to catch it early. Because if you're not looking, that's where it can become a bad situation of something that the patient had very good. Yeah. You know, w one of the difficulties in, in the monitoring part is that there have been different recommendations put mm -hmm. out there, and, and I completely understand yours. Uh, but to be clear for our audience, um, we now have a drug where discontinuation guidelines are in the package yeah. insert for nilotinib, and there they recommend every four weeks for the first year, every six weeks for the second year, and every three months thereafter. But I agree with you. I think whichever guideline you follow, you have to follow a guideline. A question I get all the time is, will third-party carriers reimburse for all of those PCRs you're doing? Have you had a problem with that? I have not. Fortunately, we have not had a problem. And I, and I think that I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm confident that we won't have a problem with that because as as, as much of a cost there is with these tests, uh, compared to the cost of the drug, yeah. uh, it's it really not as much. So uh, r we haven't seen that, and, and I'm hoping that we will never see a yeah, problem I, with I that. haven't seen it either. Do you want to just say uh, one word about the special toxicity we've seen with discontinuation? Yeah, that's important to recognize. I'm glad you mentioned it, because uh, there, there is a, probably about a third of patients that have this withdrawal syndrome. Uh, which is mostly manifested by musculoskeletal symptoms, uh, myalgias, arthralgias, bone pain. Um, it's usually manageable. It's usually transient. Um, 
most patients either don't need anything, they, they have the symptoms, but they don't need anything, or just a, uh, ibuprofen or one non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agent will, will work. Uh, there are patients who, who need more. Uh, I've had to use uh, corticosteroids in a few patients. And I have a, a handful of patients, very few fortunately, but, but I do have a handful of patients that the only thing that worked was to resume their TKI, not because they lost the response, but because the, the symptoms became just uh, unmanageable. Um, so, and, and it's important to tell that to the patient before you stop so they also recognize these and, and, and alert you if that is, because you can help most of them with, with proper management. You want to hypothesize about why this happens? I, I don't get it. I don't, I, I, I don't get it either. I mean, you were not born with a TKI yeah. and all of a sudden you take it away from the patient and, and now the, the body, you know, doesn't like it. Uh, so I, I don't know what happens. I don't know if it's sort of like a cytokine release or something like that, but, but I don't understand.